Moving east. We're going to go to the Taos uh, districts, turning around the lowest achieving schools. This is what the uh, Department of Education called uh, the, uh, the uh, programs, uh, referred to them as Taos. So we'll, I'll probably use that acronym in this. And I'm going to recognize uh, one of my uh, co authors for this study is here today, too. We were here. Uh, we just received uh, funding to continue work on evaluating um, uh, the lowest performing schools here in North Carolina from the federal government. And uh, we were here with an all day meeting with our partner. So uh, James Guthrie is here today uh, as well. So Going to be tough. So, um, uh, so in North Carolina, just to um, uh, provide a, a little bit of background, uh, it, the, as I said, the program was the most ambitious in the country, funded by Race to the Top. Um, all of the schools that were identified uh, for the reasons uh, shown here were received treatment, uh, including seven high schools that had a graduation rate below 60 but um, their uh, performance composite was high enough not to be in that group. Um, full implementation ran primarily uh, from 2011-12. As you all may recall, that money didn't get released until uh, January or February of uh, 2011, so mounting that first year was a, uh, a little difficult, but, um, but it moved ahead. And you'll see this includes uh, 65 elementary schools, 24, uh, middle schools and 27 high schools. Uh, so we go across the board there. And assignment uh, to this uh, uh, group was made strictly on uh, performance uh, composites or the overall proficiency rates that you all are used to seeing in schools. Um, that becomes important in a statistical sense that I'll try to avoid discussing thoroughly with you today. Um, so uh, each one of these bars represents the change in proficiency rate of a single school uh, with the uh, Talus schools in red and the blue uh, schools represent the closest schools to those right above them on that performance composite. So they just barely miss being in that lowest achieving group. Okay, so. Uh, what I hope this convinces you when you look at this is that you see a lot more red outpacing. So, so right here at the zero point, this would be the average growth of those schools. And there's a lot more red to the right than there is to the left. And some of those are very uh, high rates of improvement. So just in terms of looking at the outcomes, each one of these represents a single school for each bar. So this, this suggests to us that in terms of proficiency, the Talus schools outpaced those comparison schools. I'm going to give you a more precise, but I, I, I sort of think seeing is believing sometimes. So I want you to see what that looks like. And here's what it looks like for graduation rates. Now you see uh, a lot more red on the right side uh, than you do uh, blue. The bottom is almost solid blue. The, the very bottom school has um, enrolls, I think, a very small, maybe 40 students. It is a kind of a special uh, case in, in terms of the way it looks, but um, it, it is accurate. So um, here we see 75% of the Talis schools outperform the state average growth in graduation rates. 7% uh, 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 was the average growth rate in the non talus the comparison schools, 16% over double the rate of growth in the uh, talus schools. So um, now uh, both of these just re kind of reflect that one point. So uh, what about in the same kind of metrics that we used for Tennessee? Um, uh, overall, on, uh, on, 
uh, sorry, this, this is first of all, the efficiency <coughs> rates by uh, standard deviation units. We see a positive effect overall um, and a positive effect on math proficiency rates uh, and science rates that are about the same size as, the, as that Tennessee class size experiment. They're about uh, 21, 22 percent of the standard deviation unit. So, so this is the kind of effect you would expect from reducing class size by about 10 per class. Very costly. Very costly. Uh, in, in some cases, um, when we look at um, le uh, effects of by level of schooling, um, like Tennessee, sometimes these are not uh, statistically significant because of smaller sample sizes, but they're all positive. There are no negative effects across any of these. The talus value added impact, so if we looked at school value added, in the first year of operation, they produced an effect that's half again as large as the Tennessee class size experiment. A third of the standard deviation unit. In the second year, so the way this value added works is, is really important to understand. So these aren't just uh, uh, single year growth. The 26% of a standard deviation was on top of the growth of the prior year because we used the kids' prior year test scores to see what the growth is in the next year. So these. Um, um, back when uh, you used to earn interest on your bank accounts, um, uh, we had something called compound interest that we, you know, I don't even know if I teach it anymore because it uh, doesn't apply, right? Uh, this is kind of a compound interest rate. Uh, so this is a growth on top of growth, the compounding effect. And in 2013-14, it continued to uh, our estimates were 21% uh, of the standard deviation growth. It's no longer statistically significant. And part of that is as, these, as this growth gets higher, it's harder <coughs> to find a statistically significant effect. But it's still moving in the right direction. Teacher value added um, was only significant for middle schools, but that went up by 26% uh, of the standard deviation. It's not significant for uh, overall or for elementary or secondary, but they're all still positive. They're. When we look, one of the things that Talis did was put an immediate focus on literacy. And, and while that uh, uh, certainly could have been the right call, one of the things we heard from going to these schools, and we went to a lot of them in this study, was that sometimes they were afraid that um, they weren't getting math games because of the emphasis on, uh, on reading. So we wanted to check, did we see the gains in reading uh, and uh, did we see negative effects perhaps in math because of the lack of concentration on math. Uh, again, we see elementary and middle uh, positive effects in reading tests. Uh, they're small in the case of elementary school uh, math. Uh, didn't experience negative effect overall it's actually positive so it's positive and overall math scores went up about like the Tennessee class size experience I'll stop saying that too because I'm sure you all get that uh, moderate uh, positive effects on uh, science across all schools and across elementary schools you all will recall that we now only test uh, uh, biology in high school and only fifth and eighth grade science, which is the minimum requirement of the federal government uh, for the testing program. So one of the things that you're going to hear about uh, as, as you move forward, and, and I encourage you to think very deeply about, is teacher retention. Uh, prior to uh, naming these schools as the lowest achieving schools in the state, the retention rates in these uh, in these schools were about on par, and the trend certainly in the same direction of uh, looking like it was moving up. Part of that effect was the recession. So we saw a couple of anomalous, anomalous years where we hired fewer. And the, uh, I don't know if you all know this, but uh, the, in North Carolina, the, the modal year of experience for teachers is zero. 
we have more teachers in their first year than any other year, and the teachers' least effective years on average, guess zero. So that's their least effective year. So this talent pool, teacher recruitment and retention, you see it's gone to about 10% lower. So we try to investigate the, the problem is when, when you go in and you coach and you provide PD and you get the teacher to move from uh, way down to a little better, and then the next year you go in and she gets a little better, but the third year she's not there. And the teacher replaces her, it's probably zero years of experience, so you start back at the first year. And you move it along. So this is going to affect sustainability. My opinion is these effects are not sustainable over a long time without continued support and resources. They, they simply won't happen because our teacher labor market is vastly different than when any of us went to school. We can talk a little bit more about that. But uh, we see some evidence that teacher turnover may have suppressed or reduced some of the positive <laughs> So the, the positive talus effects, if we could figure out how to deal with the labor market more effectively, we could probably reduce some of those. I mean, we probably could increase some of the positive effects. Um, here's another key point. Uh, one of the early findings from our Race to the Top studies uh, when we, um, this program uh, was under the direction of Pat actually who's here today, was that um, districts could actually get in the way of these schools moving forward. And uh, rather than supporting their growth, a school, for instance, that we went into decided um, you had to have a B or better average to participate in store, uh, sports, and the district said, no, I'm sorry. We're not, we're not cutting that off. So the districts could get in the way through certain decisions. Uh, uh, districts are loath to teach a school uh, one school differently than the rest of their schools. And so it's, it's quite a serious problem. And one that's addressed in the Race to the Top House initiative and the current initiative that's going on in North Carolina by providing district level coaching uh, to help change that environment. Uh, so we see from this that the largest positive effects in school value added uh, come in those schools that receive both school and district support. This is not just district, but it's school plus district support. So the, the connections between the school personnel who are trying to make changes and the district personnel uh, is more supportive and positive uh, uh, there. So the district model, even though we talk about school intervention, if that school is still under the auspices of the local district, you have to think about the district as well. Uh, this is the note on sustainability. Let me just explain what these three columns say. The talus only are those schools who were in the race to the top turnaround, uh, uh, but had not been in the prior court order turnaround by Judge Mann. The talus plus the districts are the, uh, DST, I'm sorry, are the uh, schools that were in, uh, 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 in the turnaround effort ordered by Judge Manning, and they didn't rise up enough to get themselves above the bar, so they were once again in turnaround under talus. So they, were, they had a double dose, or a continuous dose, if you will, turnaround services. And then the DST only. Those were schools that got above the bar in, by 2011 when we were picking these schools. Uh, uh, but what you see is a negative effect in graduation rates. 60% uh, uh, of standard deviation. I think that's one of the larger numbers that you see. What you see is the talus only was effective in raising proficiency um, uh, across those years. But it took that sustained effort to uh, have a statistically significant effect on positive effect on graduation rates and school value added. So you need sustained effort in these schools over time. 
And 18 months, a year, is not likely to put them in the position where they're able to sustain themselves at a level that we would consider satisfactory for the students who are there. So what are our conclusions about North Carolina? Uh, that the um, positive effects on, uh, on proficiency and value added were moderate to large. Um, there were uh, positive effects on graduation rates, but these were not statistically significant. Uh, we measure graduation at the high school level. There are only 17 high schools. It's simply not enough, even though it, it looks as though it, it um, may have been effective. Um, uh, it, there's, it's not statistically significant, so we have to be cautious about that, interpreting that way. Uh, but as we saw, the, that <coughs> chart showed a lot of blue uh, at, on the right side and a very little bit of uh, blue on the left side of that growth. Um, the labor force uh, in North Carolina, and we've done a lot of work on that and be glad to share that with you. Um, it, we have high turnover, uh, limited experience, the modal year of experience is zero years. Um, and the turnover in these schools is higher than, um, uh, than uh, in the other schools in the state. So they're churning. Uh, right now I'm working on estimating what, what we've seen and what principals tell us is that we're underestimating this because we don't count teachers who don't stay for a semester. None of those are counted here. So we, because your data is so good, and because DST gives us, uh, I'm sorry, DPI gives us such great access, like no other state anywhere, the data is so good, uh, we're able to go in and determine that, that that turnover rate in that first. So we'll have we'll have some, some surprising facts, but first year teachers turn over at an amazingly high rate. They don't make it to the winter break in a lot of these schools. So uh, the turnaround services, uh, that's the, the model that has uh, has been developed and there's some slight changes on this. I, I'm not going to try to go through this, but one of the points I want to make is if the model doesn't deal with teaching and learning in the classroom, it is unlikely to affect student achievement and graduation <coughs> rates. If the model doesn't explicitly deal with teaching and learning in the classroom, it is unlikely to produce those effects. The structural changes to governance may be important. The, the, the changes to management could be important may set the right conditions. The change of day-to-day -day operations, I think certainly are important, but if we have to get to the key, it's what goes on in the classroom and in the halls getting to the classroom. And so if your reform strategies omit that, then, uh, and, and you'll see that there is a lot of work at the district, at the school, with the principal and the teacher going on in North Carolina to do coaching and professional development to make sure that changes are occurring in the classroom. And um, so we, uh, we see that, that we, uh, the DPI folks and Nancy Barber's here today who, who runs this uh, operation now, uh, uh, we've partnered with Nancy and other folks, Martez Hill at, at the Department of Public Instruction, to bring in federal money to take a look at this uh, over, over the next years. We're doing very detailed work on how this is being implemented. So I hope in a year we can come back to you and tell you nitty gritty what, ha what needs to happen, what is happening that is effective for the students in these schools. Now, I want to leave with, with one other comment, and, and I want to contrast uh, what we call organizational learning. If you're intervening in these schools and you're doing an evaluation, then that evaluation is being fed into the process to change the process. You're learning. An issue that we didn't contemplate in Tennessee, but has been true, is that uh, there we see what is called a see, feed, and weed approach. Seeding, we, they find 
good charter operators they feel can be successful and they seed them by matching them with the school. They feed them by trying to increase organizational learning of those charters so they get better over time. And if they don't, they weed them out. Okay. Now, this is, a, it, this is plausibly an effective strategy. The issue comes with autonomy and organizational learning. Every one of our charters is doing something else. Every one of our charter management organizations runs schools a different way. So you have project-based learning over here. You have a much more scripted type of learning over here. So um, that feeding process becomes difficult because the charters aren't doing the same thing or similar things uh, at the same time. Some of them want to give autonomy to their teachers and they control the classroom. Uh, some of them want to get autonomy at the school level and so they do similar things across the school. So the, the organizational learning is more difficult in the charter managed operation. It's not impossible. It is going on in Tennessee. These, these schools are getting better. So it's, it's not by any means impossible. It's just harder to learn from um, uh, 20 schools that are being run differently than it is to learn from schools that are hex, are, are variations on a theme. See that difference.